Hello, minions. Welcome back to Professor Awesome and the Minions of Doom. Uh, it's been, oh, almost a couple of weeks since uh, Dragon Con. I was only able to be there for half a day. Uh, some of you who were looking for me know that I canceled all of my uh, public uh, events that I was going to have because I I wasn't sure I could be there. I didn't, in fact, I could only be there for half a day of, of the entire event. Um, <clears throat> and so I was able to meet a lot of old friends, which is very nice. And also I was able to meet two or three of you uh, whom I didn't really, uh, I'd never met before, who, you know, um, one of my autograph or just want to meet me uh, and it's always good to meet minions of doom who uh, know me through these videos but I I don't know you so I wanted to really start in on my series on reading for wisdom which I kind of introduced uh, earlier and uh, this one I want to this is really an introductory topic and has to do with what we call the death of the humanities so for most of my academic career, I've been hearing about the death of the humanities, that the humanities themselves are in some way in decline uh, or dying. I want to distinguish between the death of the academic study of humanities and the death of the humanities themselves. So what do I mean by this distinction? Well, uh, I do think that the academic study of humanities is if not dead is very very sick which sounds really weird for someone who's a tenured professor in english definitely deep in the humanities and uh, i think the cause of this it's related in many ways to the uh you know the uh replication crisis in the sciences to the crisis in peer review uh etc where Essentially, what has happened in the academic world, I think for historical reasons, uh, as well as uh, other uh, forces, that the academic world has turned, has slowly sort of developed into a kind of uh, circle, a bubble of groupthink, where everyone thinks in many ways the same thing. And all these different uh, methods uh, replication, peer review, etc., that we use to keep out crackpot ideas, uh, and they do with very effective at keeping out the crackpot or amateurish or or just like uh, things which are not fully cooked and ready for publication. They also unfortunately keep out uh, really really interesting ideas very often, uh, and part of that uh, has often been looked at by political actors as saying, well, uh, there's this kind of political motive to keep out, uh, to prevent uh, viewpoint diversity. Uh, universities are great lovers of all sorts of diversity except any but viewpoint diversity. We want to make sure everyone thinks along a very, very narrow band of thought. Interestingly enough, a very narrow band of thought that's out of the mainstream uh, for the rest of uh, the uh, American public. But in terms of this, I, I actually think that's less interesting and and though it is a powerful force, it's only a side part of this because that's where people are very consciously thinking, I'm going to keep out ideas that I'm not in agreement with or I'm just not going to, I'm going to uh, not just not notice but shun things that I don't like. Uh, that does happen for sure. Uh, and overtly happens, and is bad and destructive, etc. And, and that gets a lot of uh, press. And I would say that, unfortunately, very often the worst caricatures are true. But I think the more powerful force is the subconscious one, the unconscious one, which 
often isn't in any way connected to any kind of political policy or anything along those lines. It's simply a sense of culturally this is the way I think. And I think it, so it must be a smart way of thinking. And the other people around me, those people who have hired me, have reviewed my materials. I've reviewed their materials, or maybe I've hired. Uh, those people all think the same things. And so pretty soon I think, well, this is what smart people think because it's the smart thing. And you can see how that develops into a kind of group think. And the end result of this is that the humanities themselves, uh, the study of the humanities has really fallen into decline. When I was a grad student, we were uh, we were told that we would have to help the students find their authentic voice, and this is what we were supposed to do be doing in terms of their writing. Uh, we were uh, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly discouraged from focusing uh, on issues like construction or grammar. Uh, or uh, spelling, those sorts of things. And instead, we were supposed to say, well, what is the authentic voice uh, for these students? And I felt at the time uh, that that was a great disservice to the students, in large part because although I had come out of a different demographic, instead of being from urban Detroit, I rolled out of a cornfield myself. That was me. I didn't go to school as a student to learn to have some stranger who has authority over me to tell me what my authentic voice was. I already had my authentic voice. It was my authentic voice. If someone has to develop that in you, they're not developing your authentic voice. What they're doing is telling you how you should be, telling you that your authenticity is wrong. It needs to be changed in line with their authenticity. Whereas the other kind of mechanical things that uh, that we were discouraged from focusing on actually allowed students to use their true authentic voice in a way uh, that would communicate more clearly with others around them. But we weren't asked to do that. And I'm really thinking in terms here not just my own kind of philosophical objection uh, to to that approach, but really if I'm the student, what what do I want? What is my purpose in this? And the same is true, I would say, my undergrad career. And unfortunately, I've seen many professors come in and, and do this. Uh, even today, I'll see this uh, sometimes, where we'll do a reading, uh, and the professor will come in the room and sit down and say, OK, OK, guys, so what did you think of this reading? Now that can be a rhetorical, a rhetorical approach to get the students to think about the reading. But for many professors, there really isn't much beyond that that they want to do with it. But the problem with that is, I already know what my thoughts are as a student. I want to know what you think and give me something that I can either agree with or disagree with. Now, obviously, you know, there are those who kind of lay down a, this is the this is the reading, accept it or die. Uh, and I would oppose that. Uh, you know, I don't want to set that up as a kind of, uh, that straw man is, uh, is not what I'm flogging for here. Uh, but the idea that you are not truly guiding them somewhere, that you're just taking an Aristotelian approach, but you have no direction. I saw a lot of that when I was a student, and I think it does a great disservice to the students. I hated it when I was a student, and I hate it now, uh, now that I'm on the other side of the desk and sort of see what it is. So I will often say things. One of the my <clears throat> ongoing jokes in class is to say, would someone tell me what happened in this book because I haven't read it yet? Well, I think it's obvious to everyone by the end of the, uh, by the, end of the class that I have indeed read it and studied it deeply, whatever we're doing. I'm taking that rhetorical position. Uh, simply to get them to explain it as if someone had never heard it before. And so there are way there are reasons to walk in and say that, but you really should have some direction for the students to help them uh, give structure in their minds to how they might think about a text, for example.
And then, of course, there are those who have a direction, but the direction is really reading against the text. Again, that's a, a way that has become very, oh, very common in literary circles, but also in other humanity circles. Uh, so I remember being in a class where essentially uh, the professor, the professor's theme was see this work of literature, notice how it, uh, in, it essentially reinforces a kind of oppressive system. Uh, you know, this one was an oppressive racial and a racial and patriarchal system and, and how bad it was and really teaching against the text. And I remember thinking, if this text is so terrible, why are you teaching it? Why are you teaching against it? Uh, it's not a bestseller. No, it's, it's a work of classic literature. So if it's so bad, stop teaching it. Stop creating a market for it by, by forcing people to read it. Uh, and therefore forcing people to purchase it, just ignore it and let it go away. Uh, treat it as a footnote rather than we're going to spend two weeks talking about how terrible this text is, how terrible this work of art is, how terrible whatever it is, uh, really teaching against the text. Okay, so all of that is about this problem of, you know, some of the things which have led to the death of the academic side of humanities. But have the humanities themselves died? Well, no way. There's over a, a million books published every year. You know, uh, now you might say, well, some of those are, are e-books. Okay, if you exclude self-publishing, we're still looking at 300,000 in America published uh, each year. Um, and if you, and if you might think, well, how many people are, how many of those are really being read? You know, they're being published but not read. Well, we're looking at 600 million books published each year. <clears throat> which would be an average of two per year in terms of printed books. We're not talking ebooks, we're talking printed books. <clears throat> so, assuming the bare minimum, we're really looking at at least two books being read per year per American. Uh, I think those numbers are wrong because they eliminate, you know, people passing books among themselves and their friends, using libraries, uh, online. Uh, an ebook publication, whatever, but that puts us at the minimum that people are reading an average of two books per year. Okay, um, <clears throat> and then of course we look at things like ebooks. We're looking at somewhere in excess of a million per year. Uh, again, those numbers are a little hard to come by, um, but we are looking at really, really big numbers of books. But we're not just talking about books. When I was a child. I had three. TV stations available to, available to me, three. So when I turned on the television, I had three choices. I had to watch one of those three choices or nothing at all. Uh, today, I've got more than three streaming services on demand available to me. Uh, so many. When I look at my Roku, they have so many that are trying to sell me their little library of things that I can watch as I want. So whereas... Before, the problem was, well, do I want to watch this show or one of these other two shows? Uh, it comes down to, now, you know, I have 40 choices. Do I like any of them, uh, you know, that are sitting on my queue already? Uh, this is true for music. This is true for basically any kind of art form that you could think of that... Uh, it, there's just an unbelievable amount that's being produced. Well, what about the idea of the study of this? Notice I made a distinction between the academic study of it and the non-academic non study of it. Well, if you look online, just look at YouTube, another place, by the way, where people are uploading culture, YouTube, you know, podcasts, Goodreads, etc., etc. Your average person is out there both producing and uh, and responding to cultural reviews, reviews of the books that they like, reviews of uh, the latest movie, reviews of their TV series in a very, very detailed way. I mean, there are uh, podcasts that essentially follow a weekly television program and every week respond to the television program in such a way that 
often, if not usually, the podcast response to it is longer in, uh, than the than the text itself, you know, than the television series uh, uh, was. There clearly is a hunger and an appetite out there for real engagement with the humanities. The problem is not that people don't want to engage the humanities. The problem is that they don't want to engage with the humanities in the way that the academy is, is offering or even allowing them to. Now, I do think there needs to be some kind of negotiation of that because by the same token, when I thought as a student, hey, why aren't you telling me what you, the expert, think about this? I already know what me, the non-expert, thinks about this. In the same way that universities have to put together curricula and things, there's a sense of, well, the experts should know better and so should be able to provide you with something that you don't even know that you need, you don't even know that you want. Uh, if I ask my students, for example, to put together the reading list, they could only put together the reading list of books that they already knew. Uh, that they had probably read or at least heard of enough to know the sense of it. Whereas I hope that when a student comes to my class and they look at the syllabus, most of the texts on there are things that they've never encountered, maybe never heard of before. Uh, and therefore they can have, uh, they can encounter them and learn about them in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. The same is true for any other area of the humanities. I hope that when students go into classes, they're learning about things that they didn't know about it all before, not just having their uh, their preconceived notions reinforced. But by the same token, we have to recognize that students, and indeed the society that's paying for those students through grants and scholarships, have a certain expectation about what those students will be getting, uh, what the purpose is of this. I don't think the purpose of the humanities is to teach that the humanities are bad. Uh, if it is, it's an incredibly self-defeating purpose. Instead, I think that the purpose of the humanities is to try to learn what the humanities teach us, their purpose. Uh, try to learn the thing that they give us. So, for example, in the case of literature, my belief is that literature is there uh, for promoting wisdom. And what do I mean by that? Because it sounds very vague. Uh, the idea is that I have an idea and I write down the idea because I think that idea is important. And someone else publishes or, or ascribe copies the idea because they also thought the idea was important, the idea was worthwhile. And you go through generations of copying or reprinting or translation or retelling each person involved in that because they thought it was important. So many of the ideas in the past are in stark opposition to one another. But all of those ideas that have come down to us, especially the more distant past, have gone through more and more people who thought this is worth saving, this is worth pre preserving, there is some wisdom here. And so when I am looking for things from the past, uh, when I'm reading something from the past, and it doesn't even, even have to be the distant past, I'm reading it for wisdom. I'm trying to figure out what is the wise thing that comes out of this. So when I'm teaching my literature classes, my focus is on the question of what wisdom does this text offer us? What does this tell me uh, that is usually a hard thing to talk about but can be explained in a story. And that's really what uh, the wisdom itself is. Now, of course, not everyone will agree about what the wisdom found in the text is. And of course, sometimes you have to ignore things which are foolish or unwise, though I would argue that it has been passed down for generation after generation, from culture after culture, and you look at this and say, this is unwise, or this is bigoted, or this is foolish, you may be right, but the burden is on you first to interrogate your own preconceived notions and say, is it unwise? Is that bigoted? Is it foolish? Or am I the one who's bigoted? Am I the one who's unwise? Am I the one who's being foolish? 
Sometimes the answer will be, nope, it was the text, it wasn't me at all. Though, in that case, then you have to say, well, if this text is bigoted and unwise and foolish, why am I then compelling others to write, to read it? Why am I talking about it? You know, what is my purpose in engaging with this? So, I guess the too long did not watch version of this is, I don't think the humanities are dead at all. I think they're thriving. I think the problem is that there is this academic uh, shunning of the idea that wisdom is found in literature. And that's really the reason that we have for the humanities and the reason that we have for the arts and the reason that we have for literature. And so this really, I, I think, is what I want to get at in this entire Reading for Wisdom series is to say, okay, this is what we need to do. This is how we need to look at a text to get the wisdom out of it. Uh, I will occasionally be offering examples of what I think that wisdom is. Uh, however, uh, you have to accept the idea that I am one man. And the, when you're looking at literature, you're looking at something that wasn't just produced by one person, but was often transmitted by multiple people over multiple generations, over multiple cultures. And uh, as such, you need to take what I say with a grain of salt and take the object of study itself much more seriously. Okay, so uh, I will try to intersperse uh, these next ones with lighter, uh, more of the moment subjects, but I just wanted uh, to lay that out there uh, in a video form rather than a written form so that people who might otherwise not think about these subjects uh, would have a chance to look at it and hopefully you know, start to look at their art in a different way.